Hi, I am very I am very excited today to have Barbara and Pam with us. Their topic is every AAC family needs a coach. And I've got to tell you, I've already learned a couple of things just as we were chatting and, um, and getting ready for uh, this session. So I'm going to stop sharing and hand it off to you. Um, thank you for being here. We're just thrilled to have you. Well, thank you, Gail, for this introduction, and thank you for having us, because it's a great honor to, to do the pre presentation here. Um, I will start sharing my screen, and I hope you can all see my screen. And I see people nodding, so I think that's a yes. Because Pam and I are going to talk about every AC family needs a coach. Um, and but before we go into the topic, I think it's good to introduce myself. My name is Barbara van het Westende, um, and that doesn't sound English, and it isn't. I'm from the Netherlands, so I'm actually at 5:15 p.m. today, so it's a different time zone that you are all in. Um, I'm a speech therapist. And I work for a sister where now five years. And before that, I worked in special education as an ST for 20 years. Um, and when I started working at a sister where I met Pam. So Pam, maybe you can introduce yourself. I am uh, reaching all of you today from Northern Illinois. I'm Pam Harris for more than 30 years. My son, Josh, has used AAC. Uh, together, Josh and I have overcome challenges with educators, medical professionals, family, and friends. A few times on our journey, the challenges proved to be so formidable that we've had to pivot and change our course. Uh, for the past 12 years, I've been supporting families, AAC users, and the professionals who support them uh, for assistive work. I continue to learn something every day and I enjoy sharing um, what I've learned along the way with my experiences. Thanks, Ben. So to talk a little bit about the goals for today. So if you are a professional watching, um, the goals for today is that you can understand how to guide and influence AC best practices and therapy for families, but also how you can build a collaborative partnership with families, which we think is very important, and practical ways to set up goals and work together. Pam? Uh, for any parents of AAC users who are watching or parents who have a children that they're thinking about AAC, uh, my goal today and my goal with Barbara is to help you understand why it's important for you to take an active role on your child's AAC team. And I want you to take time to recognize the importance of protecting the parent-child bond. And I want you to listen, get some tips, and gain some confidence in building collaborative relationships with your child's educator and their therapists. Because I all, well, we, I think we all know that establishing AAC doesn't happen overnight. We all wish it would, but unfortunately it doesn't. And we always say it's a marathon and not a sprint. And what we want to tell you is how to be the best coach for that marathon. But let's first start with what is a definition of a coach. And a coach is to give instructions or advice and, um, and to instruct people around you. That's what coach means. Um, Ben, what does it mean for an AAC uh, family coach? Yeah, for an AAC family coach, um, Barbara and I and our team have, have defined it to be a coach as someone who, who listens, uh, who adjusts yeah. their support based on what they're hearing, and knows how to guide and nurture and build collaboration, and most of all, knows how to keep it fun. Yes. Because unfun shouldn't be done, as Amanda always says. Um, but what are the key traits of a good coach? Um, uh, build rapport and trust. So research showed that therapists, they need to build rapport and trust and take it the time to talk to families. And that's actually real work. It's what Gil said before, is how we switch to 
giving one-on-one -on -one therapy to supporting uh, and building a relationship with the people around the AAC user. Um, uh, it's more than just testing and all the other stuff. Uh, stuff. And it's important. It's an important part of, of our jobs. Um, payments should also be like authentic. I, I think, yeah, I think a good coach for an ASC family, it's important to be authentic and a clear communicator. Yeah. And, and for me, what that means really is to be honest and it, to be able to explain things in a way that are easy to understand. Um, I think it's really important that a good coach can know the difference between the right time and the wrong time yeah. to uh, communicate. For example, I, I, I two scenarios come to mind really quickly. Um, it is not a good time for a parent to walk in the classroom as the students are arriving with their child to get just a few minutes of the teacher's time. Not a good time. And you know what else is not a good time? It's not a good time for the teacher or the therapist to walk the student out at the end of the day and just to grab a few minutes of the parent's time. Just as the start of the day is not good for you, the end of your day is not good for us because it's the start of our afternoon time and we've already got our heads and one foot out the door. Um, so I think it's really important to express yourself as clearly as you can, but to also be aware of the right time. I think it's important to focus on and, and to really listen. I think that uh, Stephen Covey said it best, and he said, often we listen with the intent to reply when we should really listen with the intent to understand. I think that a good coach takes responsibility for their own feelings. I think that that's a huge and important connection. Um, when I am being coached, to know that my coach is also a human being and has feelings and has experiences helps to make that connection. I think that a good coach always makes space for what's not working. All too often, it's, it's too easy to go along with the status quo and not to ask the tough questions. Okay, well, what do we need to work on? What needs our focus? What needs our attention? And I think the most important thing is to always be positive and to always be encouraging. And the knowledge, you, you can be knowledgeable, but you don't have to know it all because we don't know everything. And if you work and collaborate together with the parents, you will know far more things than if you do it alone. Oh, so a good coach develops shared values with families. Um, so they build trust and rapport. And the three ways to develop those shared values is to focus on the strength and not the deficits. Uh, as Pam said before, to maintain a positive attitude, even if it's not working at that time, and respecting the parent-child bond, because there is a parent-child bond, and there needs, we need to have respect for that. Yeah. Well, one way to build trust and rapport that we've found, um, I can uh, talk a little bit about this, is to build on strengths. It's kind of difficult in a deficit model um, to do this, but it's really important. And I like to share, um, and I'll share the link in the chat, that there was research conducted in 2020 and it explored the bond between mothers and their non-speaking autistic children. And the mothers involved in this study shared how important it was for them to accept the autism and focus on building a strong relationship with their child. So what I would say to therapists and to educators um, who are on my child's AAC, AAC team is, don't try to fix my child. My child, my child is not broken. There will be mothers who are still on their journey towards acceptance. Don't delay her journey. Don't fix. And also, as I said before, maintain the positive attitude. So you, well, our attitudes matter. The way our mindset is. 
um, matters. So we get to know the kids. We like them. We connect. We be a friend. We yeah, who cares and helps um, is far more important than anything. Create that bond. Uh, be positive. Um, and and start yeah be that ally start start that friendship. Um, That's right. And Barbara, yeah. the times that we've spent, you know, talking with parents, and we're trying yeah. to identify, you know, what's that secret ingredient? What makes a good therapist good in in the parents' perspective? And it really comes down to the therapist or the educator, the professional who wants and values connection with that child. It's the magic ingredient. When we see a therapist, a professional, an educator, really authentically, truly wanting to build a relationship, make connection with our child, that's it. That's the secret ingredient. Even if it means she needs to spend several hours doing that, because that also doesn't come overnight. And, and it could also mean that you don't reach your goal, goal during your therapy session. But if you spend time on that connection, you will reach far more at the end. It is so important for the parent-child bond to be respected. I know this from my personal experience, and I know it from all the conversations that I've had with families. When professionals ask parents to work with their child at home, there's a lot of research that says it helps improve the child's communication and their social interactions. So when does it work? It works when it's embedded into an existing family routine or family activity. Because there's also research out there that tells us when it doesn't work. And when doesn't it work? When it's one more thing to do, when it's one more thing to remember. I tell you, mothers will sacrifice. They will make trade-offs. They will do whatever they can to get that work done. But it leads to adverse effects. The child will not gain in communication. They will not gain in their social interactions. When the family has to find time or make time for therapy at home, it can be too much. It can create a disruption. Parents must be given the space, the permission, to reflect on their family's capacity first before agreeing to add therapy at home. So how do we effectively coach families? Because well, that's, Barbara, that's really, yeah, we, took, yeah. we took a couple of years, you know, uh, we directly with families. <laughs> we made assumptions and we tested them. We made more yeah. and we tested more. We did interviews, we did surveys, we conducted two and four week short experiments. Yeah. We had to learn how to be an effective coach, what was going to work. And there were some key findings and we're here to share those with you. Yeah. So these are the key findings, Pam, from all the well, research and a lot of words. Tell us about Barbara it. and I knew from the beginning yeah. that we wanted to help families learn AAC best practices. We wanted them to understand the ins and outs of our new AAC app proloquo. And we wanted to coach parents to become confident communication partners and support their children to build language and literacy. Wow, that was a big undertaking. But we <laughs> wanted to figure out how we could do this. So yeah. what did we learn? The first thing yeah. we learned was we learned that parents need to create new habits. So we studied habit making. Barbara, remember, we even signed up for yeah. that one week course with BJ Fogg on, yeah. on how to create new habits. Yeah. And we learned that um, to create new habits, you don't just say, well, tomorrow I'm going to wake up and I'm going to start um, eating only fresh food and I'm going to be eliminating sugar and I can do it. Well, chances are you can't. You have to break it down into very small little steps and ease into it. AAC has some very complex themes and there's a lot of topics and subtopics and big pictures and little ideas. So we had to break down very complex information 
in a way that's easy to understand. Remember, um, a, a good coach provides clear and easy to understand information. So this drove Barbara and I down a path called micro learning, breaking things down into small chunks, making it, making learning a big topic, starting with something small, but then building incrementally on this. So at the end, you have the, the a comprehensive overview of an idea. So then we took time learning how do adults learn? And there's a whole bunch of research about that. We learned about guided practice, ongoing guidance, the importance of reflection. We learned that it's important to share with somebody else what you've already learned. We learned the importance of collaboration. collaboration. Yeah. And then for Barbara and I, back to it, it was important to us, to Barbara as this um, clinical therapist, and for me as a parent, to make it fun. Yeah. And we did, and we still do, Pam. Try to. But yeah, so what we try to solve are some pain points. And these pain points that we're now going to tell about are reported by parents. Uh, and in our research, we, well, there's confirmed that there are five main pain points for parents. That's, and these make the AC journey really hard. Um, but as an AC coach or as a coach, you could definitely help with these pain, pain points. So we have feeling overwhelmed by AC. As Pam said before, there's a lot of information. There's a lot to learn and it's not going to happen overnight. It's a marathon, not a sprint. There's kind of a lack of AC knowledge. Um, parents often feel alone on their AAC journey. Even if there are a lot, there are more parents, they still feel alone on this journey. Modeling is actually hard to do. It's not something you do overnight. And it's what we also heard it's here. It's that's hard to get the AAC team on board to have the same vision and mission together. Pam. So just. Talking a little bit more and diving a little bit deeper into each of these, the first one is feeling overwhelmed by AAC. Overwhelmed, that's actually the word that is used. I'm overwhelmed, this is overwhelming. Um, this home screen is overwhelming, overwhelmed. So AAC is new and it's different. And when people tell us that they're overwhelmed with AAC, this is how sometimes it comes out. How do I hide buttons? I need to put Bluey on the home screen. My son needs to say Bluey a lot. She's never going to use the words cauliflower, broccoli, and spinach. I want to delete them and I want to put goldfish crackers and chocolate chip cookies. These are parents' way of saying that they're overwhelmed. If they're not using the word, and most of them do, it'll come out in this way. And we have something in the chat. We hear the word overwhelmed by staff working with AAC users as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Barbara and I are now working on, this is like the end of year one, researching what educators need in their coaching and what their pain points are. And overwhelmed is what that is shared by yeah. both. Yeah, true. So here are just some things that we found um, are helping to address the pain point of feeling overwhelmed. Um, setting small and easy steps forward. And we talked about breaking it down, um, taking one moment and one day at a time. We tell parents all the time, just try, just do it, have fun with it. There are no mistakes you can make. Uh, we encourage uh, and coach parents to build a team around them. We don't want families to take on too heavy of a responsibility for the success of AAC. It is, it's a team sport. Um, we coach them and share resources that are online for them to explore when they have time. We encourage them to reach out to others. We encourage them to ask questions. We help them to celebrate, to recognize and to celebrate successes. And we also coach them to reflect on what's working and what's not working. 
the second one is the lack of AAC knowledge. Um, there are a lot of parents saying, okay, now I need to start with AAC. Um, but it always seems so much to learn and to know about AAC. Um, they struggle to learn it all. And most of parents want to learn everything. Um, and they tell us that they don't often have someone in their life to help them to learn about AAC. And as we said before, and I think as you all know, if you Google for AAC or search for the big words that we use, like modeling, like other words, then you will find so much information that it's, it's, it's too much. And the things that can work is find easy to read materials that can be shared. Find other formats like videos or podcasts or uh, um, audio files, those kind of things. Make sure you use different kind of formats uh, and learn and build on the knowledge in small chunks over time. So not everything at once, small chunks, small parts of information and work with that. Uh, and make sure that new information is applied in practice. We also see parents reading a lot of books and information, but they never practice it. But reading stuff and doing things are two different things. Ask questions, dare to ask questions, even difficult ones. And uh, also join online communities to learn from others. And if you look at these things that can work, it's all based on micro learning, on habit formation, collaboration and support. Parents also often report feeling alone on the AAC journey, and we tell them that it's not, uh, that it takes a village, that it is a team sport, and we help them to identify and to build collaborative relationships with people around them who can support them and AAC. Uh, sometimes a parent, how does this sound? Sometimes they'll say, my partner, my spouse, isn't going to use AAC. There's going to be nobody else modeling but me. Or my mother-in-law thinks that using AAC is going to stop my son from talking. Um, they're just not supportive at all. And then we also hear um, the SLP doesn't think, you know, my child is ready for a robust AAC device. They're sticking with PECs. So these are kind of different ways that families can tell us that they're feeling alone and they're feeling isolated. So what are some things that, we, that can work? Well, we coach them to build a team of face-to-face -face and online people who can support and inspire. Uh, we encourage them to join online communities. And in fact, Barbara and I started an online community just for um, parents who are starting their AAC journey, we encourage them to ask questions. I don't know why parents are so reticent and so hesitant to ask questions. Maybe it's because they, they don't feel that they have their permission to do so. So we encourage them to ask questions and to share what they're learning along the way and uh, to start a chat group with, with everybody who's, who's on your team. Um, and to take videos and photos and to share their progress. Um, and then if celebrate. we go on, yeah, exactly, yeah, to celebrate. recognize. And yeah. Shanja says that um, they may be afraid they're asking dumb questions. That's right. They yeah. may be afraid that they're revealing a, a gap in their knowledge. And so maybe providing somehow a, a, you know, a safe place or a safe way for them to ask any questions. And know that if you have a good collaboration and a good connection, it's also easier for the parent to ask the questions. Because we always say there are no stupid questions. If you have a question, it's because you don't know or you want to know. Um, so and we, we often people, take the responsibility yeah. ourselves. If you have a question, yeah. it means that we haven't done something right. So yeah. we really need you to, to ask those questions because it's going to help us you know, better support the next parent. And, and parents love knowing that they're going to make the road easier for those coming behind them. Yeah. So if you can let them know that these questions are also going to help you become better at what you do, um, it, it, it makes it, I think it, it eases it. It makes it a little bit easier. So the other pain points that we've identified as modeling is hard. And all I have to say is modeling 
is hard. And many of the parents that, you know, we were talking to and that we were coaching, um, they tell us, you know, that a AAC device has been sent home um, with their child. Maybe they were given a 30 or 45 minute tutorial on it. Um, and they're told to model at home and they don't know where to start. And they don't know if they're doing it right. And when you don't know if you're going to do something right, or you're afraid you're going to do something wrong, you don't do it. Uh, joy. You don't want to fail. You don't want to fail. Yeah. Uh, when Joy first started um, her journey as an AT liaison, it was intimidating to sit in a room with licensed professionals. Boy, I know that. Yeah. Yeah. So what can we do? Uh, what have we, what if Barbara and I found that that can help? This was a really big thing for us. And we were stunned because it was, it seemed so obvious after we stumbled on it, but parents need to understand that they have to be comfortable with the AAC system first. There's no expectations for the parents to use the AAC with the child until they feel that they're comfortable and confident enough with it. They have to use it. They have to, after the children go to bed at night or, or after they leave for school in the morning and they're on their lunch break or even stopped at a long train on the road, they have to have access to that AAC app and they have to be comfortable with it. And they have to do it on their own time before they start using it with their child. And sometimes I think that it'd make a lot easier for a teacher too, if she was given the time and the permission and the support to learn how to use the AAC tool before she was expected to integrate it and to use it in her classroom. And then we, to we, we coach them to start to model words that what they're thinking, and then what other people are doing, what they're seeing. And we tell them that, yeah, it's going to be clumsy at first. Yeah, this is going to be really hard and you're going to make mistakes, but don't let that stop you. We encourage them and we share with them and we show them videos of other people modeling AAC. We do two things. We show them a really excellent master modeler. Yeah. And then we show them it just happening in its very early stages. And how still what's powerful is the connection that you're doing with the AAC user. And that's what really counts more. And then we start them small. Again, it's that small little chunks. Just think about how many times you could use the word go in one day. A lot. <laughs> A lot of times. Lots, yeah. So we say, yeah. just focus on the stop and go. Yeah. More and all done. If parents could model those four words, all the different times that we use those words and, and, and those intentions throughout the day. Look how powerful a communicator that AAC user would be. So Joy um, has added that when she has sent home the app manuals, all oh, the app manuals, mm -hmm. or the instructional key points for parents and encourage them to play with it, they have to do that. They have to yeah. play with it. And I like the idea of sending home written material with it too, because some people like to read the manual. Yeah. Yeah. True. So I'm kind of move forward, Pam, because we, uh, I'm looking also at the clock. Yeah. <laughs> and another important one is uh, hard to get the AAC team on board. And we hear parents tell us that it's hard to get teachers on board or SLPs on board or the team around them on board. We also hear that from teachers that it's hard to get the parents on board. There is so something in the con communication or collaboration is going wrong there. Um, and as Pam said before, we need a team of people around us to make this happen. They can do it alone, uh, but it's difficult. Uh, and also it's difficult to be on the same page and to have the same idea. <clears throat> so what can work is that you stay in contact and hold regular meetings. And this is why I think the next meeting from Echo Voices on March 15 would be really nice to listen to for this part. Um, an important one, give an equal voice to all team members. The experience that we have as a teacher or an SLP is different than we have that you have as a parent, but all the voices are equal. We need to listen to each other. Uh, and so everyone is an expert in their own way. Uh, take photos and videos of AC moments, celebrate them, but also 
create a video when something is going wrong, when you hit the wrong button twice and share it with others because we're just human. Share what works and what doesn't work with the team. Um, as Pam said before, start a chat group. Um, start chatting to each other, sharing, showing, those kind of things. Collaboration. Connection and collaboration are important words in this, uh, this whole thing. And it's actually the coaching cycle. And I will show some slides about the old versus the new. So what we saw in the old coaching cycle, old between brackets, because it's still used, we did a lot of observing, a lot of assessing, goal setting, planning, reflecting. And it might have included some team meetings, but the team meetings, but there was also definitely a lack of follow-up. Uh, and parents still struggle to get starting and most of all, keep going. And some of the times, maybe most of the times, AEC users were not involved. So if we look at the AEC coaching cycle, as we're talking about, a new way based on research and insights, and it's not something, and I want to say that, it's not something that we need to do extra to do more, but it's actually replace what you currently do. Dive into one single AEC topic. Don't put everything together. Break it down in small chunks and work with that. Try to build in self-reflection observations. Set an intention and share with the child. Plan, practice, observe, and change. Uh, reflection and share the outcomes. And that's the whole new cycle. Um, it's new coaching cycle outcomes will be that build better AC habits. If you start with one single topic and you link it to a habit, it will be easier. It will build confidence because it's not that big, you break it down. It builds better connections and relationship with the child, better outcomes for families. It will get families on board. Uh, you have shared priorities and goals and in individualized and it's flexible to the family. As Pam said before, if we think we need to work on topic A, but there's a lot going on in, at home, at the family. Maybe there's no room for topic A and we need to switch to topic B or C or whatever we choose then. Um, so we talked a little bit, a little bit, well, we talked a lot about this now and it seems like we had the perfect solutions, but there, well, actually, there are always barriers <laughs> and ongoing issues that slow us down. So Pam, share with us. I think that the expert or the medical model is a barrier to collaborative parent professional relationships. Yeah. The thought that authority is granted on the basis of claims to special knowledge and skills. Well, that thought has kept families out of the decision making process for for too long. Um, yeah. Sometimes parents can be the AAC expert after diving deep into the vast information online. And the bottom line is, is the parent is always the expert on the child and on their family. Yeah. So being the know-it-all that reinforces those experts' roles. So use common language, use easy language, and try to reduce the gap and remove the barriers to communicate by using, well, simpler language than we do right now. And it's also uh, the SLP as a gatekeeper. Uh, SLPs were, or SDs in the Netherlands, were gatekeepers for a long, long time when it came to AEC. Um, and we need to remember, and that's what the, we also talked about, Pam, uh, is that we're not alone on this journey. We are not the gatekeepers. We need to collaborate and decide together with everyone around the AEC user. And it's expectation, so the ideal versus the actual practice. Um, there's often a mismatch. Mitch, mismatch between that um, and collaborative problem solving. So every day in every situation we see this, we have expectation of what's ideal AC best practice should look like. Um, what we should or could be doing, but to compare this with might actually be happening, uh, this is just reality. In real life, something else will happen or the situation changes. Um, and then run, not blame, we shouldn't blame anyone for this. We should be collaborative and flexible and work together as this. Um, so, yeah. yeah, it's pretty easy to sometimes say, well, you know, if you were just reinforcing, you know, the, these three words at home, um, 
he'd be, you know, able to be using these now communicatively in school. Um, that's old, old thinking, and you have to work really hard just to set that aside. Um, because having a disabled child for most of us is is new, it's unfamiliar. Um, AAC is is can for some be scary. Um, you have to give families permission to start slow yeah. because slow does not mean stop. No. No. Slow it's is still a marathon. Yeah. yeah, it's a marathon and not a sprint one step at a time. Take 10 forwards and three back and start over again. Instead of instead of you expecting something yeah. to look like at, at home, um, just be be honest and and talk about it and problem solve. How can we make this happen? Can we make this happen? What will work if this a little bit more collaborative? So, but we also have different peoples, different people, different people, so different motivations. We have different personalities. So every parent needs their own personal guidance. It's not something that we write down in a book and we can apply on everyone. You need to take a look and listen to the parent that it's in front of you. There is no universal way of guiding parents. Um, every parent needs something different when it comes to implementing AAC. And we need to take this into account and adjust your coaching style, pace and guidance. It's an ongoing collaboration. Um, and I think we talked about connection and we already talked about collaboration. And I think this is something that I also see within our team, Pam. Um, also within Assisted Wear, but also within our team. I have a team of four. Uh, one special educator, educator Shannon, uh, one SLP, Amanda, then Pam as the mom, and me as an SD from the Netherlands. And we work together very closely and we collaborate. Um, and I think this could be the same way if you talk about an AAC team around the AAC user. You know, Barbara, we, I wasn't yeah. supposed to like you. I wasn't oh, supposed no. to be able to, <laughs> to work with you. You know, Barbara spent um, her career in a self-contained classroom yeah. and I you know my, my son Josh is 34 years old now and he was educated in our neighborhood school in a gen ed classroom so all I have to do is say that and say that it was you know almost 30 years ago for you to know that it was a struggle and we had lots of challenges because yeah. we were on the front lines doing something that was very new um, and so it became ingrained it became a part of who I am and what I thought to be true. And here was this self-contained special school SLP, you know, the nemesis of, of everything that, that I believed in for education, for kids who are non-speaking. And yeah. it works. We it works. stand witness yeah. to the fact that it can work. And again, it goes back to that magic ingredient. What was most important to Barbara was making connections yeah. Yeah. with the, with the non-speaking students that she worked with. It didn't matter what their environment was. What mattered was the relationships. Yeah. And that, that just triggered something off. It, it turned off the flame that always stayed in the pit of my stomach. And, and that collaboration just grew. We, we believe that that work can work for everyone. And not only within a company as a sister wear, but it can work for every therapist or educator or whoever works with AAC users in connection with the parents. Yes, Sarah, we, definitely, you're right. we, definitely, we definitely believe that. Yeah. yeah, and all the research and everything we did, Pam, and with the whole team, that, um, yeah, well, that resulted in Proloco and Proloco Coach. So I'm not going to do any kind of a sales pitch. I'm just going to say that the work that Barbara and I have, have been doing and have done over the past couple of years and continue to do now was to help assistive wear create a new service, an AAC service, looking at the pain points, looking at what's not working. And um, what it ended up being is ProLoco, our newest AAC app, and ProLoco Coach 
Barbara and I were the original authors of the content in Proloquo Coach. Since then, we've added to our team to include an educator and another speech language pathologist from Australia. And this is an example of collaboration. With one Proloquo license, every important person in that AAC user's life gets access. So the family purchases a license for their son. They can then share both apps, Proloquo and Proloquo Coach, for free with everyone, the teacher, the SLP, all the therapists, grandparents, siblings, BFFs, everyone, for free. Truly a mic drop example of collaboration. So if you're listening to me now, and if you work with AAC, you can get free your own one year license that we will renew. Proloquo is based on decades of research from anonymous data gathered from thousands of Proloquo and Proloquo to go for text users. Um, Proloquo Coach prepares families to support their children to learn language through AAC. And it teaches AAC and you're not gonna be surprised at all in readable chunks and easy to understand language that it encourages collaboration. Yeah. Yeah. And Build uh, habits. Yep. Yeah. And small yeah. little changing your habits. Um, if there was time, I could do a quick demonstration. Timekeeper. But we don't have time. But no, we don't, we have, don't time. have time. Because we have a very interesting case study afterwards. So. But I did drop the link, everyone. I yeah. encourage you to, to get the link, um, get the app, check it out. And of course, ask any questions. I'm going to put Barbara and mine's email addresses also in the chat. Okay, Barbara, thanks. So talking about questions in the meantime, because I can't see the chat from here. So are there any questions at this point? Yeah, it looks, like, um, it looks like Sarah is asking, what if the school purchases it? That's also possible. Uh, I don't think we need to go into detail uh, now, but the school can purchase it and can share with uh, also with others. So building the team in Proloco is possible. Um, maybe it was Sarah who was asking a question. You can share your email address or send an email to Pam so he can she can give you the information about how that is working. Because I think if we go into the whole license thing now, <laughs> um, then the 25 minutes is over. Um, but please ask your questions through email um, so we can share the information with you. Okay, and I'm going to, I'm going to drop the um, school purchasing plans information yeah. into the chat. Oh, cool. Thank you so much. Okay, so shall I move forward to the case study? Yes, please. Yes, so we're going to do a case study. And we're going to do a case study from Jasmine and mom on her AAC journey. And I'm going to explain a little bit what's going to happen. Because I think we now have 20 minutes left instead of 25 minutes left. So um, we will do a collaboration part. And you wouldn't be surprised after this uh, presentation, I guess, we're going to collaborate together. So we're going to divide in two groups um, in breakout rooms. And the first group, um, the, the case studies are in the Google Drive. So I think you will share those, Sandra? Yeah? Yes, okay. I have shared it in the chat. Yes. Yeah, again, chat. Okay. So there is a little story about Jasmine. And the first group, you will be the professional. Uh, and the question have, you have Jasmine's daughter, Rosie, in your class. How do you think you can support Jasmine on, their J on her AAC journey with Proloquo or any other AAC app? Group number two, you will be Jasmine. You will be the mom. What kind of support do you need in taking the steps on your AAC journey with Proloquo? Uh, I want you to collaborate with each other, come, come up with some ideas, what you think is important. We will take, let's say, 10 minutes, and then we come back to the general room to discuss with each other. And I want to ask you to copy-paste the things you come up with in the chat, so everyone has the possibility 
to download the chat and to use it in your own school or in your own time. So let me stop sharing my screen. And then we can, are there any questions so far about the case study? So I just want to clarify what we're, what you're asking us to do is look at the, the two different case study documents, depending on which group we end up in. And yeah. you'll be automatically sent into that group and then yeah. um, answer the so, question. Let me share one of the case studies because I think That's it makes good. it Thank more you. clear. So this is group number one. You will see the case study and I'm looking to the left because it's on my other screen. And uh, so you will see its name, it's the, her name is Jasmine and she's 36 years old. She's married to Joshua. She has, they have two, child, two children, Rosie who's eight years old and autistic and James who's five years old. And they started Proloco with Rosie about a year ago. Jasmine and AC, here you'll find a little bit of a description about how Jasmine feels, things, what she does, those kind of things. And also a quote from her. And then below the line, there's your question. So in group number one, there you are the professional. So the people in group number one, they will answer this question. How do you think you can support Jasmine on, and I see I made a really big title, but okay, can support Jasmine on her AAC journey with Proloco. And we ask you to collaborate and to write down some of these on the paper and in the chat. So this is about guiding Jasmine. And in the other one, sorry, I should have opened them both. Here you will find the same information, but here in group number two, you are Jasmine yourself. So what kind of support do you need as being Jasmine in taking the steps on your AC journey with Proloco? So one is from the professional's perspective and one is from the mom's perspective. Okay. That's enough information? Yeah, I think we're good. Okay. Uh, so Chandra's gonna make the breakout rooms available to us. And uh, you, you might have to, uh, so it, it'll automatically send you to the oh okay room. Well, let's go. Yeah, let's do that. Have fun. There they go. Okay. <laughs> So and then there's a timer in their room, right? Chandra? 10 minutes. Okay. 10 yeah. minutes. It'll give them a 30 second warning and then it will throw them back in here. <laughs> I love it. And if you want me to close them at some point, let me know. Yeah. So we have 15 minutes left. Um... So I'm going to go ahead and join uh, group two just to okay. see how that conversation goes. You can. You you can join and come back to the main room if um, if you want to as a co-host. Okay, thank you. Well, ladies, I think it is going very well. Oh, I thank you. I like this. Um, <laughs> I personally like this topic. I we have to but one second because we have still have the recording on and it's recording the main room. So I'm not sure if you want this conversation in the present in the recording, otherwise you need to pause it. This is very cool couple. that yeah. you guys do this. Yeah, it's very cool. We're pretty Welcome excited back. about it. Hello, everyone. I hope you had some fabulous conversations. So welcome back, everyone. I think everyone is back, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, so I will open the chat. Um, but at first I want to, because we have a couple of minutes left and I want to ask group number one, and I definitely don't know who was in group number one. So I hope you all know to share, to share some of the, 
uh, of the outcomes of the ideas of the things that you wrote down or thought about or who can I give the floor? Can I can I volunteer someone? Yes. Well, oh. I'm fine with that, but I'm not the one who I needs can, to speak. So. Oh, Georgian. Thank you. I don't you. mind sharing out. I um am neither a speech pathologist or a parent of an AAC user, but um a lot of the conversation was really based around that collaboration with the parent, um, really working on practicing the skills and please. Joy and Julie, correct me if I'm wrong, or Julie, I can't remember now who was in our group, um, <laughs> but really practicing those skills The just because the icons are there doesn't mean the student understands what they are, um, doesn't mean the family understands what they are. Um, so really coming to some mutual agreements about common language and um, working on those very underlying basics to give a strong foundation. Um, I'm trying to think of what other... Was there more, Julie? What I miss? Uh, well, I, my main recommendation was teaching aided language stimulation to Yasmin and also supporting her and encouraging everybody in her child's life to also use aided language rather than you know trying to make the kids say things. If you know if they're if the kiddo is using their beautiful you know point or reaching for something, then we assign meaning. We go, oh, well, you're telling me I want the play doh, and yeah. That way, the child learns the language for what they're trying to tell us. And it's also acknowledged that it's more than just the AC tool, because everyone is communicating. Even if you don't use AC yet, you are communicating and you are looking at things. Maybe throw, th throw things through the room or uh, point or smile or whatever we do. There's always a form of communication. I would okay. um, ask Noelle if she would be willing to share her point she made in our group about uh, their voice. Um, yeah, now I need to remember what I said. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, we were talking about, you know, just experience in the classroom and, you know, what, you know, some staff can get, um, I don't know, frustrated is the right word, but, um, you know, a student has their way of you know expressing themselves by either pointing or using their gestures and we're like hey we have this great amazing AC app on this device you know why aren't you using this and um a lot of times the tendency in classrooms that I've seen is that you know we're like nope you can't have that thing until you tell me on your talker and that's well intended but what we want to think about a few things. I like to always put myself in the person's shoes that is, is, you know, not able to use their voice. And what would I do in that situation? And what I would do is take the talker and throw it across the room, which happens a lot, right? Because that's yeah. like, why are you doing that to me? Um, I've been communicating this way my whole life and now it's not working. So you want me to use this thing? So, um, so we talked about a couple of things um, in this situation. So just, again, putting yourself in their shoes, um, and then thinking about things in a couple of different ways, thinking about AAC as a new language. So be really patient with yourself and you need to have that receptive input first and you need, you know, it needs to be meaningful. Um, and then jump in, Julie, if you could remember something else that we said, I'm blanking out a little bit. Thanks for bringing that up, Joy. Is there something else? Sorry. Oh, I, well, I wanted you to share that because it was just really profound to me to, because I was one of those as we're trying to encourage our classrooms to use the devices and the voices that we're providing. Um, I have a few that I'm really frustrated with that they aren't really implementing that device as much. And Noelle's point just really emphasized, I was like, oh, God, I am really not seeing this child for who they are and how they communicate. So it was just really, um, it was like a light bulb for me, like, oh, okay. They don't feel seen or heard when we're trying to do that app because that's not who they are. We have to teach them how to be the person who knows that app and knows that new language. So I found it very profound and, and I will change my approach now as coaching. So. Oh, that's beautiful. I just love the way you put that. That was so good. Yeah, yeah that was beautiful. And, and you know, we, we don't, 
it's not something we would ever figure out on our own. And when I say like, hey, don't do this or try this other way, I've done it all the other ways. I've, I've done all the things I say not to do, you know, I promise yeah. you a hundred times. So, um, but you did put that beautifully. And it's hard for us to put ourselves in that position because we're not in that position, right? We've had all these years and experience of language. So um, thinking of it as a new language, also Julie pointed out, I think this is brilliant. Um, I've thought about it, but never actually done it bringing out a core board in another language, like Polish or something with symbols, like, you know, like Chinese or, or Mandarin or something, and then giving it to the, the staff and saying, hey, tell me what you want. And, you know, it's a whole nother situation. So I think that's a cool, I mean, it's, again, it's not, um, it may not work for all classrooms or all the situations, but it's just a great, great way to give empathy and, and perspective. It's also like to give an example because we always say it's learning a new language and it, it, it is. Um, we compare it sometimes with knitting. It's also believing and knowing that everyone can learn this. It's not going to be an easy road. It's not going to be happening overnight, as we said before. But I can't knit a sweater. But if, I, if nobody believes that I can knit a sweater, I will never try to knit that sweater. And Maybe I end up with a scarf, but not with that very beautiful Icelandic. And this is not my example, it's from my colleague, but Icelandic sweater with all the horses on it. So it's, it's we as communication partners need to use that language. It's what we said to when we were waiting while you were in the breakout rooms. We all use AAC. How many of you use email or text? or send messages? How many of you use emojis? Like a thumbs up or a thumbs down or a like? We all use AEC, so it's not something new, but AEC, it's new because you have to learn it, but it, it should be common, a common thing. It should be something that we, we look at that we all use AEC. So um, I wanna break in because I, yes, I want sorry. the group two to have a chance yeah. to we are a little bit over time and what we have the ability to do is keep being over time, um, but we want to acknowledge that some of you may have to leave um, because of, of your schedules. I did post, we took notes in group two, I was the scribe, so I put those in the chat and um, Thank you. that we had some really active, interesting conversations about how we would like to be coached, but I want to let other people talk about that and um, we can take just a few more minutes before we have to close this session. I, I don't see your notes. They're a little bit chat. above that are in the chat. It says group two notes. Yeah, that's all I see is group two notes. Scroll down a little bit. I. I hit so, return too fast. It says a uh, parent interview, ask more questions. Um, oh, there it is. The, <laughs> use the device yeah. with me. Yep. I'll imitate Rosie and I can ask questions about how to respond. Ideas and tips on how to model. Yeah, because modeling is hard, right? <laughs> uh, and I'd like to meet other parents. Yes, a parent group. That sounds fantastic. Yeah, learn, meeting people who are both more experienced and at the same level. Yeah, that's important. And also how room. to involve yeah, siblings and other family members and maybe Absolutely. in classroom how to involve other students. Why use AAC only with one student if you can use it with all? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, great observation. Right, and especially, especially involving a little, you know, a five-year-old who you know, might kind of resent all the attention that the older child gets. And so if you involve that child with the device, it, it should help that child feel more included. Yeah. Uh, Brandy, yes, there will be an evaluation sent out if you were registered for this session and uh, it'll, I will take attendance and the evaluation will go out and then we will share it with our lovely presenters.
Okay. That's and you, you know why, right? We really want you to be honest, Barbara. And I say we have very thick skin. Our goal is just to make this better, to be better coaches, to be able to help more families. Um, so we take all your all of your feedback. Um, we welcome it and we take it very seriously. So Chandra, how about if we stop the recording now? We want to say thank you to Pam and to Barbara. It's been a wonderful session. I have a whole page of just quotes that I 